Okay, we're going to try something different this week. I'm recording the data portion of this lab from home uh, since we're not going to be in school tomorrow, and most of you had requested that we try it this way. So uh, this is something new to me. I'm going to actually try to record with the video camera and the screen simultaneously, so you'll see me bouncing back and forth between the two. So this should be the document that you're looking at from our Unit 2 labs. Um, our objective today is to investigate the relationship between acceleration of a system, the force causing the acceleration, and the mass, or in other words, the inertia of the system. Now, what's kind of interesting about this particular lab is that we should be able to predict the mass of an object that can't easily be weighed or that can't easily be measured. So predict the mass of an object. Now, the objects that we're working with in this lab are small enough for us to weigh with a scale. Um, so we are going to do that, but our hope is that the computations that we obtain um, end up being, um, they end up matching our, our measured amount. And what's nice about this technique is that it could be applied in a much larger system uh, if we were trying to measure the mass of an object that's way too large to actually put on a scale of any sort. So as far as the equipment that we're using, um, we're not using a, a Vernier Dynamics track, but we're using the PASCO track from class. Um, we'll use pulley attachments, end stops, the PASCO plunger cart, uh, the target, cart weights, sure, uh, post for the cart, we don't need that one. Uh, we're going to be using the TI-84 Easy Data app. That's a little bit easier than installing the LabQuest software. Uh, we have a motion sensor. This is like a radar uh, that's going to be recording the velocity and position of an object. String, washer, and we don't need these clips, but we are using a beam balance. In class, we've been talking about Newton's second law of motion, and we recognize that as the formula. The uh, force required to move an object is equal to its mass times the acceleration. And if we modify that equation, it's going to look something like this. Now, in this particular um, activity today, the force that's introduced in the system is going to be calculated. Um, calculated. We talked in class a little bit how we can calculate force, and in this case we're going to have a hanging mass that's introducing a downward force. So uh, the downward force here is simply the weight of those hanging objects, and that force is going to introduce some amount of acceleration around this pulley uh, into this cart. Now we're going to be using a um, TI-84 calculator, one of these, to... Uh, measure the acceleration or calculate the, uh, the uh, acceleration. And so the claim is that if we have, if we know the force that's being put into the system and we can determine the acceleration of the object, then we ought to be able to calculate the mass of the object. And so if we continue reading with the instructions in the handout here, it states that in this experiment we're going to use the dynamic track and the mass being pulled by gravity to accelerate the system. The acceleration will be found with the aid of the sonic motion sensor and our TI-84 calculator. And we should note that great care has been taken to assure that the mass of the movie system does not change while each data set is being collected. So when we determine the mass of the system, that's going to be a collection of all of the objects uh, for the entire um, experiment. So we're going, to, we're going to determine the mass from the very beginning and then calculate the mass at the end. So I've already leveled the cart, and we've got it pretty well flat on my workbench here. And I've cut a piece of string that's a little bit longer than one meter, and I've tied loops at each end. So we're going to do this right now. We're going to use a triple beam balance to measure the mass of the cart uh, with, well, we don't need the metal post attachment. Um, we'll just use tape to hold things in place. And we had talked a little bit in class about the inappropriate way to measure an object's mass, and we should use a a balance in order to do that, to measure the mass. And so one of the objectives that's uh, requested of us in this class by Cincinnati State is to ensure uh, our ability to use a triple beam balance. So I'm going to set this thing up over here, and hopefully uh, you all have seen one of these before and recognized how to use them. Let's see if we can get this all in frame here. 
Uh, and the goal is to take the objects that we're going to be using in this uh, experiment and find the total mass so that uh, we can verify whether our calculations are indeed accurate. So uh, we're going to be using these washers uh, one at a time to increase the uh, force that's being used to accelerate this cart down the track. Uh, the washers will be held in place by a piece of tape. So I'm going to include that piece of tape in this measurement. If I end up having to reuse this tape, I've got other pieces that are uh, the same length, so I'll be able to replace it and assume that the mass is the same. Uh, so I'm going to put the uh, washers onto the car, and then I'm going to use this string and this carabiner to kind of fasten everything together. So I want to make sure that all of that is included in the mass of the object. Now, um, to use a triple beam balance, the idea is that we can adjust these weights to different positions and ultimately get this beam uh, needle to balance right here uh, in the center. So uh, with all of our sliders set to zero, we can see that the object here is more massive than the balance indicates on the right-hand side. So um, we'll just try to get close here with our largest mass first, 400. Looks like 500's not quite going to do it. Uh, so we're at 550 now, and notice I'm putting these um, weight markers right in their notches to get a, a good, accurate measurement. Uh, 540 is a little bit too much weight, so I'm backing it down to 530. 520 is not quite enough, so now I'll move down to my uh, smallest mass and adjust it from here. We have to be a little bit patient to let the mass level out because our instructions do say to measure to the nearest tenth of a gram. Now sometimes using your uh, finger can bump the balance and uh, disrupts our reading a little bit so uh, in class next time we do this we, I might have you use a pencil just tapping tapping this from the side to uh, to level things out. I think we've done pretty good. Um, you can see on the right hand side that uh, the needle is right at zero. Our, um, I'm going to lift up this camera so you can see everything better. Uh, this was out of view just a second ago, but all of our objects that are going to be in this system are now on the balance, not resting on anything else. Um, the scale reading, so you all can see that, is showing 500 grams plus 20 grams plus 4.5 grams. So if we come back to our, uh, our lab document, we can jump down to the last page now. And I had some leftover data in there. Uh, so we now have a system mass of 500, what did we say, 24.5 grams. Take note that our book, our booklet does want us to record mass in kilograms. So we'll call this 0 0.5245 kilograms. Okay, very good. Coming back to the instructions now. Okay, so I've now completed that, and I don't know if you can hear the rain on the uh, tin roof of this garage, but it's coming down a little bit heavier. Um, I'll try to do a voiceover or explain... Um, after the fact if, if this audio isn't coming through very clear. Uh, but we've just now completed step number three. Off camera I looped one end of the string over the cart post. I didn't actually loop it over the post, I actually tied it to the cart. And I've ensured that the string is horizontal when it passes over the pulley. And then um, tied everything off and we've got it at a position now where uh, this system should be ready to hang some weights on it to um, to create this, this data collection. So I'm going to move this camera now and hopefully you can see it a little bit. <clears throat> We've got the cart and the string that's pulling the cart is pretty level. Uh, the string is down here. We're going to attach some masses to it to introduce some forward force and we'll get this thing moving. So now I'm going to set up the um, the data collection component and I'll resume recording in just a second after that's done. Okay, so I've got everything set up. I did this off camera and I'm just going to kind of scribble this out. 
because we're not really following any of those instructions here. Uh, we did set up the, or I did set up the TI-84 uh, and its uh, data collection tool there. So, whoops, it should be crossed out here, step four. Okay, so now at this point we're going to use the balance again to find the mass of one of the five washers and record this in kilograms as the pulling mass in table one. And we'll calculate the uh, force here in a little bit. So instead of just using uh, one of the washers, I'm also going to include the mass of this, um, this hook uh, because it is uh, fairly massive. It's got a fair amount of mass to it, so I want to include that in the first uh, pulling mass. Now, remember, these were included in the total mass of the entire system, so uh, we're not changing the mass of the system here. We're just using this part as our uh, mass to provide the force to introduce some sort of motion in the system. So I'm going to set it on the um, scale, the balance, and here again we're going to try to get this thing to balance out. Uh, we've got 10 grams, 20, 30 grams, 40, 50, 60 grams. It seems like a bit much to me. But I suppose it's right. So 60 grams. 70 was too much, so we're going to just kind of gently nudge this along to see where we're at. And it's leveled pretty good. That's even better. So I think we're going to call this uh, 69.1 grams. So on our worksheet, sorry, I keep getting you turned around here. On the worksheet, uh, we want this measured in kilograms. So just side note here, 69.1 grams. If we move our decimal three to the left, that's 0 0.0691 kilograms. Okay, so in the interest of time, I went ahead and measured the pulling mass for all five of our different uh, washers. Uh, so in row one, that's just one washer. Row two is two washers. Row three, three washers, and so on. So uh, with this pulling mass, since it's directed straight downward due to gravity, you should be able to calculate your pulling force. So we're going to skip column number two for right now. We're going to move forward to the acceleration values. Now that's where our TI-84 um, is going to come into play, and we'll try to uh, get some of those numbers for you right now. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is take you over to the setup. Now first off, before I look at the calculator, here again is the cart with the extra masses uh, setting on it, and the uh, washer and the hook that's getting ready to introduce that um, acceleration force. Now, if I come over here and look at my TI calculator, uh, you can see that it's measuring some sort of distance right now. Um, this sensor is measuring the distance in front of it. So here's a view of that sensor again. So in front of that sensor, we're measuring the distance, and it changes with uh, the position of that, that object. So I'm moving my hand in front of it right now, and you can see how the distance changes. Um, we're going to pull this, or I'm going to pull this cart back, and I'm going to try to set this camera in place here so that you can see this screen. Actually, I don't know if that's going to show very well. Let's try to put it this way. Okay, that rain's really coming down now, so hopefully you can hear me all right. Now I've got this cart positioned so that it's reading zero on my monitor, or as close to zero as I can get it. So I'm going to reach up and press start. Alright, I'm going to try this one more time. Um, we've got this distance reading zero now, so I'm going to reach up and press start. And we'll press OK. It's giving us a warning that we're about to reset some data. 
And as soon as I press OK, the um, motion sensor is going to, going to record data points. So I'm going to press OK and release the card at the same time. And hopefully we'll see some trajectory that we're, that we're after. So here we go. I'm going to give this a try. Now hopefully on this data you can see uh, that my distance from start down here was zero, which is good, and then we saw this parabolic increase. Now at this point right here, I suspect this is where the cart hit the end stop and bounced back. So we're going to ignore that data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into the Analyze option, choose number seven to select some region. And we need to set the left bound. So right here at the beginning is OK, so I'll press OK and I'm going to select the right bound bring this data point back here. I don't want to choose this top point because there might have been some inter interference there. So I'm going to come just to the left of that high point and press OK and that looks like the data that we're after. If I analyze this data with a quadratic equation fit we can consult the uh, calc students that are in the class and take note that this function represents the position of the cart over time. So the position of the cart over time. If I want this object's acceleration, well all I need to do is take the second derivative of this particular function. Now what that means, I'm going to switch back to my uh, screen here. All right, so what that means is that if our position function is equal to the quadratic 0.5543x squared minus 0.2046x plus 0 0.120, uh, again, we can consult our calc students in the class to find out what the second derivative of this function is going to be because the second derivative of this function is going to be our acceleration. Well, we can, you know, bore you with the instructions on how to do that, or I can just give you a nice little shortcut hint here. Uh, we're going to take this 2 from the quadratic's leading term, multiply it by this leading coefficient, and that's going to be our acceleration. And that appears to be 1.1086. That's our acceleration in meters per second. 1.1086. Now, I'm going to go ahead and report the uh, next collection of data, and I'm going to um, uh, just go ahead and record all of this information for the next 14 trials, just so that I'm not talking over the rain and uh, clarifying some things. Um, but I think after I collect this data in this column, then uh, this column this and this will all be calculated values and I'll try to talk you through that when I return. So hang tight. Okay, um, so that you get a chance to kind of see this whole uh, experiment in action, I'm going to record a couple of these runs here. These might end up being the last ones anyway. Um, the, uh, the mass that's pulling this cart is getting uh, pretty great here and, and we're starting to see uh, the potential for damage. So this, like I said, might be the last series of runs. But I just thought I'd share it with you in, in real time here.
Okay, and this will be the last one. So I'm going into the calculator, I'm resetting all of the data, I'm finding the zero starting position, the start data collection, and I have to go in here and uh, clear out all the extra data that's on the right side of that graph that doesn't represent the quadratic behavior. And now we'll find the quadratic fit. We'll take that leading coefficient and double it. Okay, so like I said, I think that's a good stopping point for all of the, the data that we have right now. Uh, what I think we ought to do is start thinking about what it's going to take to calculate the pulling force, the average acceleration, and experimental mass. So let me set this camera down and kind of talk through this while the, the screen is still up. <clears throat> so if you recall... Uh, pulling force, the downward force due to gravity is essentially the weight. And now the weight is going to be our mass times gravitational constant. We have the mass for every series of trials, and you can now calculate that pulling force. For the average acceleration, well, we're just going to take the average of each of the three runs within the trials and compute the averages here. And then lastly, for experimental mass, well, we already said a minute ago that the mass of a system is going to be equal to the force divided by the acceleration. Well, we've now calculated our force. We've calculated our acceleration. Let's see what happens when you calculate mass from there. So it's my hope that the mass that you compute on that last column ends up being very close to this number up here. And of course, if it's different, we can discuss why that may or may not have happened. Be sure to go back into your uh, lab manual here, though, and look at these final computations because of the analysis that, ha analysis that has to be done at the end. Uh, there are some computations for experimental uh, differences uh, that I'd like for you to report here. Now, you will notice that um, there is... A series of computations that we should perform for table two. We're just going to skip that one. Um, if you can't tell, I'm having a bit of trouble with uh, the data collection and the, the noise today recording this video uh, remotely. So we're just going to skip this one. Uh, but what we would have done um, if we had time or if we were in class, uh, I'll show you real quick. is uh, we would have repeated the exact same scenarios, uh, only this time with an additional weight onto uh, a set in place onto this cart. So I don't know if you can see that now. Uh, imagine the uh, washers that were providing the forward motion in the experiment before, but now we introduce an additional weight or perhaps even two additional weights here. How would that change? Well, the argument there, of course, is that the force needed to move the cart remains the same. So we're using the same force each and every time. But now the mass of the object's different, so we would anticipate the acceleration being different as well. Again, we can measure the force, we can measure the acceleration, and we can use those two items to compute the object's mass. At least that's the prediction. So um, to draw this to a close, uh, let's see here, we're, we're ignoring this row. We're not going to collect data on it. You're going to be able to compute the experimental mass and average it out and place it here. The average of the experimental mass when compared to our system mass that's been measured should be very close. 
And if they differ, we can talk about that here. Um, I had some students real successfully complete this slope of best fit using Microsoft Excel last time. And I also had some students that used the TI Inspire calculator, and that's fine too. Uh, so I'll leave that up to you uh, to, to find the equation of best fit for, for the slopes of the line that, uh, the slope of the force line uh, from our data table here. So I think that's going to do it. Uh, this video is starting to run pretty long, but I think you've got enough information to work with it. I apologize for the noise. I won't know if it's, uh, if you can actually hear me or not until I publish this video. So fingers crossed that it's okay. Otherwise, um, I'll try to type up or, or record an audio summary of what's happening here. I uh, hope this works out. Thanks for watching.